found out this morning if Kim invites me back next year, my business card may have a different name on it. But we shall see. Uh, but there's a lot going on on the market, and you know, we published our 2019 outlook in mid-December called Investing Amid a Carousel of Concerns. And when we wrote that piece, the, the, the thought process behind the Carousel of Concerns is, you know, look at this bull market that, uh, that you just heard Jeff speak about. This has been the second strongest and longest bull market in history. And all along the way, there's been so many concerns. And as one concern recedes, what happens next? Another concern comes to the forefront. And if you look at this chart, which I call the admission price to the stock market, we've had 17 pullbacks of at least 5%. We've had six pullbacks of at least 10% as well. Uh, so it's, it's not a straight ride, but during this move, we've been up over 300%. And then December came. December is normally supposed to be a good month, right? Everyone's in the holiday spirit. Uh, last week of the month, I told my wife I would stay home with the kids. I wasn't going to write. I wasn't going to answer CNBC or Bloomberg. I was going to stay home with the kids. And on Monday and Christmas Eve, what am I doing? I'm writing a market note because the market's going crazy. And it's the worst, uh, worst uh, Christmas Eve basically since 1931 or in history. So I want to talk a little bit about, about that. But since that time, what have we we've seen? We've seen the panic in reverse, right? We've had this strong rebound. And the one thing I think it's important that I hit on quite a bit, it, you know, the market's all about expectations. And I think people are really nervous about what was going to happen with the market going forward. So what caused the correction? What caused the correction in December? There's a couple of different things, right? There was concern about the Fed, right? That, that, that the Fed was going to cause a policy mistake. That led to economic or recession concerns. There were concerns about earnings, right? There was concern about trade as well. So what's interesting, if we move forward, I love this chart. It's the S&P 500 along with its trend of the 200-day moving average. And what you saw is that you got very extended, the rubber band got very extended to the downside. But before I just talk about what's happened since then, I want to take a step back to last year around this time. When we came in the money show in February, you know, the market in January was going up every day and we had a great 2017. We had a tax stimulus package that was passed. Ahead of us was the best uh, growth rate in the economy for several years, 25% earnings growth. If I would have told you that last year, that that was going to happen, what would you have said? Good ingredients for a good stock market. But what was the problem? We had such high optimism in the market, and the market was very extended to the upside. But remember what I said earlier, it's not about good or bad in the market, it's all about expectations. If you look in, in uh, early uh, 2018, do you see how far we were above that moving average? 14%. So we had all good things happen, but expectations were too low. You go back to earlier, late last year, and you were as, as extended to the downside as you were to the upside in 2018. So what caused the rebound? Well, one, we saw a capitulation from investors. We had almost $60 billion come out of the market in December, the most since 2008. And all the fears that people were concerned about, there's good and bad about this. That week, the last week of December, when I was writing on my kitchen table, um, we, we had identified 23.50 in our outlook as the downside level. Two days later, we came out and said the risk reward is very favorable to move in. We still think the market has upside, but short term, I think it's going to get more choppy and we're likely to have a little bit more of a pullback. For the year, we still see upside, and I'll walk you through that, and I'll also walk you how we're positioned. We certainly expect to see overshoots in both directions this year, and I'll try to walk you on how we're thinking about this. Not only how we're thinking about this, how we're investing um, our clients' uh, portfolios. Okay, so a couple of other things. Do you see that 18.5? That's a forward PE. That was January of last year, right? That's where that optimum was very high. I think Jeff just pointed out earlier that we hit 13 and a half multiple at the lows. Now we're around 16 as of yesterday. That was the old support for the market. Investors all year last year jumped in at a 16 multiple. We think short term that becomes a little bit of a ceiling for the market. So we. You know, the market's had a great move off the low, 16%. It's normal to have some digestion, some churn, maybe a little bit of, of a move down. Ultimately, we still think we move higher, but in the global ETF portfolio that I've run, 
we gradually have raised a little bit of cash, uh, not huge, you know, six, seven percent, just to take advantage of some of the pullbacks. And to give you perspective of how, how this tends to play out, right? No one has a crystal ball. We can only use history as a guide. These are some of the, sh the sharp pullbacks we've seen uh, during this bull market. And what tends to happen after you have these shock periods in the market where you have these sharp declines, you tend to have a reflex rally, and then you have a battle between fear and greed. So let's talk about that for a second. The battle between fear and greed is this. Let's say you were investing had a lot of cash last year and you were waiting for a correction. And all of a sudden the market's down 15, 20, 25%. What are you thinking about doing with that cash? Putting it to work, right? On the other side, what if you were and the investors were fully invested, maybe overexposed to equities, and all of a sudden you're down 15, 20%. You've been caught off sides. As the market rebounds, what are you thinking? So, so that's that battle between uh, fear and, and greed, and it tends to happen over months. Now, there is the potential of just a straight V-shaped recovery to new highs. It's a possibility. When you look at history, it's not the high probability event. I don't think that we need to retest the lows fully, because unless the economic recession concerns come back or the Fed policy concerns come back, there may be something new that pops up, but you don't have to retest the lows, but it would be normal to see some backing and filling. One of the most positive things I will say is, you know, the buying power that we saw, the buying panic, the thrust that we've seen, we can measure that historically and say, what does that mean from the market? On a 10-day basis, we saw such strong buying power that we've only seen about 26 times since 1990. When you look forward one year, one year out, the market's been up 25 out of 26 times. I can't guarantee it's going to go the same way this time, but when we invest, we don't invest again with a crystal ball. We invest with the weight of the evidence. This is a positive that suggests any pullback sh should, be, should be bored. But again, I think investors should be prepared uh, for more volatility. And I'd also say, if, if you were one of those investors that were panicked in December, you know, and you, I would also just say, hey, am I in the right allocation? You may have been overexposed to equities. As the market moves up, you might want to go ahead and just reevaluate the, the portfolio. But ultimately, we still think we move higher. As far as how are we allocating, we invest globally as well. And again, this is not just what I'm saying. This is how we invest money uh, within our, our group. Um, we do have an equity tilt to fixed income. Fixed income is still important to help provide stability. Uh, you know, the market was down 19, 20%. How did fixed income do in the fourth quarter? It was up a little bit. So it didn't have great returns, but it provided stability. Uh, we have a U.S. equity bias. We're emphasizing larger mid-caps. Sectors, we have a, a mix of offense and defense, right? If you're gonna have more volatility, you know, we have industrials, um, we have technology, which has done great. If you have any progress on trade, the industrials will, will move up further. But also, when people get concerned about the, the growth side of the equation, we have things like healthcare consumer staples. So that's what we mean by a barbell. We're underweight international markets. We've been underweight for some time. Much like Mr. Mobius discuss, uh, discussed, we become more favorable in emerging markets. Uh, in the global ETF portfolio that I run in October, uh, we went to the, the greatest overweight we've ever been. We've paled back a little bit because it's outperformed by a decent amount, but we still think there's more to, 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 uh, to run ultimately in there, and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss why. And then on the international market, even though we're underweight, we favor Japan relative to Europe. Um, and I'm going to walk through pretty quickly just some of these points, and then uh, we'll see if you have any questions. But, the main thing, this is a little confusing chart, but we, we always go to probabilities, right? I'm not, um, we always look and say, okay, how does the market tend to act and how, how do we expect it to act? As the stock market has pulled back and valuations have come down and interest rates have come down, the risk premium between equities and bonds have become more attractive. That's what you're seeing in that far left chart. Then we can quantify when we're in this environment, how the stocks tend to act 12 months going forward. Right now, we're in the most favorable bucket. Again, it's not a guarantee, but the weight of the evidence suggests that, um, you know, when you look a year later, you tend to have good returns in this bucket of returns. Turning to position within mid-caps, so mid-caps typically 2 to 10 billion under the rad radar type of stocks. The one thing that stands out to us is that mid-caps were trading at a huge premium to the overall market, a 30% premium in 2010, 2011, relative to large caps now you're trading at a discount of about 5%. We've tested this out and said, hey, when, when mid-caps trade in this range, 
what's the forward performance on average? And this is typically the best, the sweet spot for mid caps. So we've upgraded our position in mid caps this year. Turning to emerging markets, we showed this chart all last year and we said, you know, if emerging markets pull back to about a 10 multiple, that's where we get more interested. Uh, emerging markets, they're higher risk, higher return investments. Uh, in the US, does anyone know what the average pullback you have in any given year? Just the average pullback, what's the guess? An average pullback, the deepest pullback you have is about 14%. Does anyone, anyone have an idea in emerging markets what the average pullback is? 20%, that's right, but the snapbacks tend to be um, stronger as well. So in, in, uh, in the fourth quarter, we hit a 10 multiple in the, uh, in the emerging markets. That's the same level that we hit in 2016 when there was also many concerns about global growth and also concerns about China. So we hit that level. The second thing that turned turn us more positive is the technical condition. As the U.S. markets were making new lows in December, emerging markets did not make a new low. So that's a positive divergence, and that's typically a sign of, of a leadership change. The third thing is we feel strongly that China will do whatever it takes to stabilize their economy. They've done 50, uh, 60 steps since last year to stimulate the economy. They started off slow, and right now, as a percentage of their economy, the stimulus in the, in the economy is 3%. That's more stimulus than they did in 2016 as well. So, if you put together, valuations have become more attractive, about a technical condition, and China, which represents about a third of the index now, doing whatever it takes to stabilize the economy, we like the position. Now, just in context, emerging markets are about 11% of the global economy, so just realize it is a higher risk, higher reward type of play, and the tariffs will also still be a potential risk. But at this point, we think the risk reward is still relatively favorable uh, in that market. And this is what I was talking about on the price trends. You can see in the top price chart that emerging markets never made a new low. The bottom chart is how emerging markets are performing relative to the S&P, and you see that they've, they've hooked up. Okay, the last point I'll make real quick is on the uh, international markets. International markets are cheap. The expectations are very low. That's the best thing I can say. The, you know, the bar to have a positive surprise is very low. What you're showing on this chart is, um, from your vantage point, on the left is relative valuations to the U.S. They are very cheap. But the only thing that has kept us from upgrading it is the earning trends relative to the U.S. are also weak. And a, a lot of times when you invest overseas, whether it's in international markets or emerging markets, it comes down to sector exposure. If you look at developed international, they have a lot more exposure in financials. And also Europe, there's a lot more exposure in, in Europe. Why has the U.S. outperformed Europe so much over this bull market? Because technology is the biggest sector. So if you become more negative on technology and more positive on financials, that's good for Europe. That's good for value versus growth. At this point, we're still, we're still um, you know, um, underweight the position as of now. Again, rather, in, within international markets, we'd rather be in emerging markets. And then lastly, as I mentioned, we still like Japan relative to, uh, to Europe. As for time, I'm going to let that one, as far as more detail, go by. Um, but the main uh, takeaway, I want to make you read these uh, five font disclosures. Uh, but the main message is this. Uh, you know, as far as, as far as the overall markets, as equity markets, we think it's a balancing act. You know, we've had a nice run up. It's normal to have some type of consolidation, a little bit of a pullback. We'd be looking at that as an opportunity. Um, overweight the U.S., seeing opportunities in international markets, seeing some opportunity uh, and mid caps, and then we didn't discuss it, but the fixed income portfolio will probably help you balance some of these kind of overshoots which we still expect to see uh, this year. So that's my uh, 2019 story. Kim, did you want to open it for any questions or did you want to get up to the next speakers? We've got two minutes, two minutes, make it a good question. We got one in the front. Are you talking about the S&P 500, by the way? Yeah. So the question was about the S&P 500. There's something called a death course, which is a technical term, which means when the 50-day moving average crosses below the 200, it's a negative. I would say short term, 
um, first of all, the statistics on that, when you look forward, is very mixed. So I wouldn't just basically buy or sell based on that signal because it's, it's mixed when you look at the data. We tested that historically. The only thing I will say is the 16 multiple for the market and the 200 day moving average are right around the same place, around 2750. So we think the upside for the market short term is probably capped around this level, 2750, 2800, maybe a little bit above there just to squeeze people out. But that's kind of a short term ceiling for the market. But the same token, if we have a pullback, we don't necessarily think you have a full retest because that buying pressure was so strong on it. So again, short term, maybe that's a little bit of an issue. As we get out a, you know, a past a couple of months, I don't think it's the end, end of the world. And we also think recession risk is relatively low. Those tend to, those tend to happen, um, big bear markets tend to happen around recessions. And we still think that's relatively um, a low outcome. So got time for one more question maybe? Okay, if there's no more questions, Kim, we'll move to the next speaker.